Today we celebrate Mary, Mother of God. It's important to, to tell you a little story. One of the retired ladies in the church was praying a rosary up in the front here. A couple of the kids from St. Joe's thought it'd be kind of funny. They went up to the choir loft and go, hey, watch this. One of the kids goes, this is Jesus. The woman didn't blink. The lady didn't flinch, didn't do anything. And one of the kids goes, I think she's got hearing aids. So the kid goes, this is Jesus. Nothing. Maybe she's really hard of hearing. Okay, this is Jesus. The woman stops, looks up, turns halfway around. Would you be quiet? I'm talking to your mother. <laughs> That didn't happen. <laughs> Ready for your word of the day? Theotokos. The what? Theotokos. The God bearer. That is a Greek word. That's how we translate mother of God kind of loosely into English. But the one who bears God is the one that we celebrate today. It's important, we celebrate this, it kind of comes out of a reaction to the opposition to the idea of the Theotokos, the God-bearer. The opposition comes from ancient theologians and still today from, from some Protestants and the understanding that they believe that Mary is the Christotokos, the Christ-bearer, or the bearer of the Anointed One. And, and that does sound good, that sounds reasonable. We can call her the mother of Christ, but the, not the mother of God. Because if she's the mother of God, then there's something greater than God there, right? No, that's not, that's a misunderstanding of the appropriate, the relationship going on there. And we have the Council of Ephesus to thank for that, clarifying what that means. Mary lived in Ephesus, and it's for that reason that they had this Council of Ephesus to decide, or not to, de to decide, but to proclaim what had always been and to clarify, to sort out that understanding of Mary. Not as Christotokos, but as Theotokos. Why is it important to understand that? Because not so much that it, it, it changes who Mary is, but it changes who Jesus is. So, Saint Cyril of Alexandria, he said that if you, talk, if, you, if you call Jesus, or you call Mary the Christ bearer, then you're looking at dividing Jesus into two different people. A human person who was the son of Mary, and a divine person who was not. And then you have two people, and that's not good. That was unacceptable, because it's destroying that perfect union of the divine and the human found in Jesus Christ. It sabotages, in a sense, that fullness of the incarnation, the depths of God's participation in the world, and the extension of salvation to humanity. Another way to clarify that would be to call Mary, Mother of God incarnate, Mother of God enfleshed. Mother of God enfleshed in her womb. And it helps to look a little bit more at Scripture and what Scripture has to say about this. Mary found out she was pregnant, so she went to the hill country in Judah to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, when she heard Mary's voice, the child leaped in her womb and she said, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Mary was speaking in defense of the Theotokos, the God-bearer, because within the womb of Mary already is her Lord and God. She reminds us also that we are called to be Theotokos, God-bearer. We all must bear the image and likeness of God wherever we go. Each one of us is called 
to love. And God is love. And so what are we doing? We're imitating the Theotokos, the, the God-bearer, by saying yes, like she did. And we do our best to avoid sin or the near occasions of sin. We might even make New Year's resolutions. I'm all in favor of them. I asked one of my friends last Lent, so what are you giving up for Lent? My New Year's resolution. <laughs> so we ask the Mother of God to intercede for us, to guide us. And I can guarantee when we make that commitment and those resolutions, we'll notice a difference. One of the greatest resolutions to make is to pray the rosary every day as a family. The family that prays together stays together. I'm sure you've heard that phrase. But it is so important. I remember when I was growing up, we would pray the rosary every day after milking the cows at night, during Lent. And then other times we would pray um, just before bed. All of the kids, all the little kids would get together uh, in the family. And there's nine of us, and so some are already gone by then. But we would pray together each night. And looking back on that, that was very important. And the message that that sends is clear. That we come together to grow in holiness, that we come together to ask for the intercession of the Theotokos, the Christ-bearer, the God-bearer, pardon me, the one who bears God. And so when we are continually asking our mother for the good things that we need, we are sure to receive them. And we are truly children of God. So if Mary is Jesus' mom and Jesus is our brother, then Mary is also our mother. And so, that's why it says in the second reading, as proof that you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you know you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through God. And we should remember that. And I remember talking to, to my brother and, and, uh, when his kids were a little bit younger. They would pray a decade of the rosaries. A, one decade of the rosary because the kids were like two or three years old. And when you're dealing with a two or three year old, the attention span is a little bit shorter. And then as they grew, they would expand the rosary. And sometimes what they would do is the kids who were old enough could go pray on their own and they would pray the liturgy of the hours. It's another fine resolution to make, to find out first off well, what is the liturgy of the hours and to begin to pray them each night or each morning and to use them as spiritual weapons. So, how do we get started? Well, there's information in the back of church on how to pray a rosary. There's information on the... Um, internet on how to play litur Liturgy of the Hours. You can Google litur the Liturgy of the Hours and actually uh, find out a lot about them. And it is a challenge. You know, I was just thinking about this, you know, this is my last weekend of Masses here as the, uh, the priest here. And, and I head to a far off distant land. It's a half hour away. You can come and visit. Um, you will be in my prayers, but I also ask you to do something that is extremely important, that you pray for the priest that's coming here, because he is going to be coming here, and Boyd, and Stanley, and he's going to be working towards bringing together three different communities in some ways, and that is going to bring with it some challenges. And to not only pray for him, but to pray for those churches that right now are sitting without a priest at all. I know one in Marshfield that's going to be without a priest for six months, and that's what they've been told. And there, uh, I think there's some other parishes down by La Crosse that are right now without a priest because there's just no more priests to go around. So pray that these um, transitions go well. It is always a difficult transition when we have to lose something. To lose a priest in residence is very difficult. You've had a priest in residence here for ever. And it's a challenge, but I love the way Father Felix has arranged it. He was going to have the school here, which will bring 
with it a reason to come and visit regularly, if not daily, at least three times a week, I would suspect. And it's going to live in Boyd and then have an office in Stanley. So he will have a reason to be communicating with all three on a regular basis and working with all three, bringing um, together that unity. And to look for the fullness of that unity as we move forward from Christmas through Lent to Easter, when, um, as far as I know, the Easter Triduum will be celebrated in the middle, in Boyd, which is the largest of uh, the three buildings, to bring together, and that be that first wonderful time to bring together three different communities. And I like the way Father Felix puts it. He said, priests are not, by nature, polygamists. They have one family. And that's what he meant by that. We have one family. He has one parish with three sites, three places to visit. And that's so true. It came to be very apparent to me when I was working with Father Bob Flock down in Bolivia. You think we got it bad here. He had nine communities. I got to visit with him over the course of two or three weeks, all nine that he was in charge of. And that some, they didn't have masses this weekend, they had it next weekend. And some had it every, like once a month. And the rest of the time the community would gather together. It was too far for them to travel on foot to go to mass and so they would just gather together. And it made me aware of how desperate the need is. And some people say, well, you know, that, you know, the need with the Hispanic community, well, what is it? Well, they have more people at mass than this parish. And they have nobody, they've had nobody for three months to prepare them for marriage and prepare them for baptism. And I realized the great challenge that that presents to me that even though I, I don't get a raise in pay, I get plenty of overtime. And, and the challenges that that presents. So if you would, please pray with me and pray for me as we move forward into, I guess you'd say, another era in the history of the church. And to know that it is going to be a movement in a positive direction to not leave any communities without any type of leadership and to divide and minister to everyone in the best way that we can. And it also calls upon the faithful to respond in new ways to new challenges, to be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit in unique ways. And so I ask for your prayers, for me, for, for Father Felix, and for all of those who are um, going to be making this move this next week. I think there's nine moves. I don't know, the list was really long, I couldn't figure them all out. There's still some stuff that's up in the air, so pray for that to be resolved, because um, some priests, not sure if they're, they're, you know, where they're at in ministry, um, and so pray for that, and pray for resolution, and pray for an abundance to vocations to the priesthood and religious life.